James is going to lead us in a, uh, in, in a conversation that really goes to the heart of why we pulled this conference together, which is new, looking at new opportunities and new mechanisms and new lines for engagement between the U.S. and Cuba, case studies from business, health, and the environment. Uh, and again, for the sake of video, but also just to be polite, uh, James Williams, who will moderate the panel, is our friend who's the director of public policy at the Trimpa Group and has a lot to do with how this conference came together. David Guggenheim, president of Ocean Doctor and director of the Cuba Conservancy. Phil Peters, director of the Cuba Resource Center and our advisor on, uh, on Helms-Burton uh, legal matters yesterday. Uh, and Gail Reed, the international director for medical education cooperation with Cuba. James, the show is yours. Great, thank you. And I'm, as we start, keenly aware that we are standing in between you and cocktails. So while mm -hmm. we uh, can't necessarily have the moral authority of the Archbishop, we at least have you know the best looking panel of the day <laughs> up here, and we're going to go along with that. Um, <laughs> wow, that, that worked. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we've heard over the last 48 hour, 36 hours here, from secret talks that have continued throughout every administration to the contentious debates in the exile community in Cuba on the island. And a lot of it is focused on where there hasn't been cooperation. Um, what is interesting, and I think often underreported, is there is significant substantive cooperation, collaboration, engagement that goes on between elements of the US government and US civil society and Cuba and the Cuban government that are worth talking about. Um, they've gone, they've waxed and waned with administrations, um, opened up more under Clinton, closed down some under Bush, and have really expanded under the Obama administration. Some of these areas, in addition to what we're gonna talk about today, they've come to accords on search and rescue, oil spill preparedness, direct mail, migration, counter narcotics, and some of these technical agencies within the governments actually have very strong working relationships, particularly uh, in the national security arena like the Coast Guard, and that has led to some much more positive interactions in what could have been particularly dangerous situations when we had that, un that man flying a plane through South Florida that lost consciousness, entered Cuban airspace, and I happened to be at the NSC, meeting with the NSC that, as that was happening that day, and they were like, this, this would have been a serious problem potentially a few years ago when we had less communication on a regular basis with the Cubans. So I think there are... One, these technical arrangements that are important can sort of spell disasters, um, but also we know that there are a lot of challenges, legal under current law, but also just general misopportunities that people aren't taking advantage of. So I'm not gonna belabor that point anymore, but to say that we're gonna sort of explore three different examples of where that cooperation exists under current law. I want to ask the participants to talk about three sort of core areas within their subject matter. One where cooperation is already existing now under current law, where it could be expanded without having to change the law, and then where you could really see cooperation expand if the law were to change, whether that executive action or legislation. <coughs> and so with that, we'll turn it over to, thank goodness I don't have to do the introductions, because Bruce did, to David Guggenheim to talk about the environment. Thank you. Good afternoon. Gracias por invitarme. It's really an honor to be here with you all. I'm much more comfortable in a wetsuit than a wool suit, but um, I'm trained as a marine biologist and I sp I'm in my 15th year working in Cuba. I run a, an organization in Washington, D.C. called Ocean Doctor, a uh, nonprofit uh, conservation organization, and our biggest project is called Cuba Conservancy. And in all of those, uh, most of those 15 years, I tried desperately to stay immersed in water and not in politics, but I think as you'll see, I'm now very much immersed in politics, but I think good politics, um, because collaboration in marine science and the environment um, is one of the few areas uh, where we've really been able to achieve strong collaboration. You know, the, the Straits of Florida we look at, and the political rhetoric says they separate the United States and Cuba, and in fact, uh, if you're a marine biologist, you put your head below, 
they connect us. They very much connect uh, the United States and, and Cuba. Uh, if you look at the telemetry from these sea turtles that were released in the western tip of Cuba, one of them went up into US waters, one went over and hung out in Cancun, one went all the way to Nicaragua, and strangely, all the ones with Cuban names stayed in Cuba. <laughs> Science has not explained that yet. But if you love these species, and we all do, of course, um, we have to look across political borders because turtles don't know when they're crossing international borders if we want to understand them and protect them. And they're cute, they're really cute. This is a black grouper in Jardines de la Reina, Gardens of the Queen. Cuban fish actually grow up to be American fish. <laughs> they really do. Um, and the science bears it out. The currents run from the south of, of Cuba up in the loop current and up to, uh, through the Florida Keys and up the east coast. And the larvae stay viable long enough to make that journey. So even if you don't care about Cuba at all as an American, uh, it's in our selfish interests to care about what happens in Cuba's ecosystems. A good friend of mine in Sarasota has tracked manatees that have made the crossing, apparently. It's the first time it's ever been documented from Florida to Cuba. So we're really connected. And, you know, sometimes neighbors don't get along very well. But, you know, if something happens in the neighborhood, neighbors have to find a way to rise above it and work together. And, you know, we found an example of that a few years ago with the Gulf oil spill. Um, and, you know, I called a meeting in Washington, D.C. with the State Department. We had the interest section on the phone. And I said, okay, guys, look at this oil. And at the time, you may remember the modeling studies showed, if you look at that modeling uh, path, the northwest coast of Cuba was on the receiving end, potentially, of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. A, a, cosmic irony to the fact that we were so paranoid about Cuba drilling for oil. And what the, the reality was our government was very flat-footed. Their Rolodex is 50 years old, and they were very dependent on the NGO community and all of the collaboration that we had achieved to be able to start making contact with the environmental community in Cuba. Fortunately, that, that scenario didn't uh, unfold, and of course now we're concerned about Cuba drilling off of its waters. They haven't hit the mother load yet, but modeling studies do show that about 90% of any oil uh, accident, any blowout, would, uh, would land in uh, U.S. waters and, and do so uh, with just in a, a couple of days or so because of how swift those currents, uh, those currents are moving. Um, the President's uh, report on that does reference Cuba, interestingly. Another reason that brings me back to Cuba, it'll be my 80th trip coming up next month, um, are scenes like this. Do you see any Taco Bells or uh, strip malls in that picture? I mean, Cuba still has some of the most stunning, intact ecosystems left in the Caribbean. Part of it's an accident of history, but part of it's because of a concerted effort on the Cuban government to put together a world-class area system of protected areas, including 25% of Cuban waters in marine protected areas. Now, in comparison, even after the recent presidential announcements of protected areas in the Pacific, we're around 2%, and the global average is around 1%. So 25% is a huge number. Our, one of our main partners, the University of Havana Centro de Investigaciones Marinas, the Center for Marine Research, um, some of the work that we've done um, is simple exploration. This is an area that just has never been rigorously explored. So together we've published dozens of papers, created the first ecosystem maps of uh, Cuba's Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they have two boats. One has been at the bottom of a river for 15 years, so that is actually the good boat. It's um, made out of cement and, um, you know, gives you an idea of, of the fact that Cuban scientists are dealing with really serious resource issues. They're brilliant, they're well-trained, but really need our help in order to explore. 
And one of the things I'm proudest of is that students like these, I took this picture about 10 years ago, have been able to base their master's and doctoral dissertations on our collaborative work together. And you know, if you're a marine biologist, it is kind of important to get out onto the water and into the water. The woman in the foreground, Patricio Gonzalez, sent me this photo when she dis defended her dissertation a few years ago. And two weeks ago when I was in Havana, it was announced that she is now the new director of the Center for Marine Research. So people like her are entering their careers thinking of their American uh, neighbors to the north as friends and colleagues, certainly not enemies. Strange friends, but you know, we mean well. Most of our work is focused on corals. And the story of coral reefs has been a devastating one globally. They are so important to the world's economy, to the world's species, but we've already lost 25% of the world's reefs and we're on our way to lose another 25% within the next couple of decades. Uh, and if you took all the coral reefs in the world and put them together, they would fill an area no bigger than the state of Texas. So that's all we've got worldwide to deal with. They're precious and they're disappearing. And the problem is you've got local threats, pollution, overfishing, and global threats like climate change and what I call its evil twin, ocean acidification. That same CO2 is making the oceans more acidic and dissolving away anything with a calcium carbonate shell. So people like me start thinking of things like that. You know, a time machine. Let's go back in time and fix this. Let's you know, it's, it was, it's getting depressing. And I, I actually did find a time machine. But it was a 48 Dodge in Come Away. Um, Cuba really is that time machine because so many of its resources are frozen in time and well protected. Um, you may have seen Cuba, the Accidental Eden, part of the Nature series, where I'm excitedly yelling about this amazing coral that's still left. But I hadn't seen Gardens of the Queen yet. That's an archipelago on the southern coast, about 50 miles offshore, and it is spectacular. And I don't know if Columbus was a diver, because he was the one that named it, but um, this is what he would have seen. It probably looks very much like the way it was 500 years ago, and it really is an underwater garden. And Fidel Castro also loves Gardens of the Queen. He used to fish there. He is a diver. He used to dive there and spearfish. And I think that helped because Gardens of the Queen became Cuba's very first uh, marine protected area. And it is still the largest no-take marine reserve in the Caribbean. It's almost 1,000 square kilometers. There is ecotourism there, but it's strictly limited. 1,000 divers per year and 500 catch and release fly fishermen. Some areas in Mexico have that number of visitors a day. So they've really tried to limit visitation to be able to preserve these areas. And it's like a Jurassic Park moment. This is a Nassau grouper. I hadn't seen them in 10 years. It's an endangered species. They follow you around like puppies. Uh, a black grouper. These fish have no fear of humans because they're not being hunted. A goliath grouper, this is a baby. They get up to seven or 800 pounds. Uh, this is a critically endangered species. Um, that's as, as endangered as you get before you disappear from the planet altogether. And sharks. You know, that is a sign of a very healthy ecosystem. And I'm sorry for those of you who don't love sharks, but if you love coral reefs, you have to love sharks because they're a critical part of the ecosystem. They maintain the balance of populations and keep those coral reefs healthy. I took this picture in June. This is Elkhorn coral. This should be the icon of the Caribbean. Um, and sadly, this species, very important, is now 95% gone from the Caribbean, according to NOAA. Uh, and yet, at Gardens of the Queen, it stunned me to see scenes like this that go on for about 30 miles. It is so healthy, healthier than I can remember when I first started diving 41 years ago. Brain corals, very healthy. Pillar corals, a fairly rare species. And the mangroves as well. And other cute creatures in the mangroves, like the sutia, and iguanas, and other things with teeth. 
crocodiles, frigate birds, um, really healthy, yes, mosquitoes as well, is very healthy mangroves, um, and, um, and don't forget the hehenes and seagrasses and sponges. So I got a call from, of all things, 60 Minutes. And I said, who is this really? Um, and it was a producer from 60 Minutes who, they, to their credit, wanted to do a story about coral reefs and the plight of coral reefs, but they knew the public wasn't going to get it unless they saw what a healthy coral reef looked like. And there aren't that many to choose from, at least not in the Caribbean. So they sent a team down, along with Anderson Cooper. Just for the record, I had the hair first. I'm older. Um, and uh, Portia Siegelbaum from CBS uh, played a very major role in making that story happen. I think it was fantastic. Um, I'll show you the teaser. It was Christopher Columbus who named this area the Gardens of the Queen after his queen, Isabella. But the real gardens, he probably never even got a glimpse of. To see them, you have to go underwater. This is really the most incredibly well-protected and flourishing reef I've ever seen. Every time we went diving, we could see sharks circling our boat before we even went in. Our guide said they wouldn't bother us. We certainly hoped he was right. Yeah, I was the guide. <laughs> and they asked me not to kill Anderson Cooper and said, maybe he shouldn't dive deep and maybe he shouldn't dive with sharks, which, of course, was the very first dive he did. Uh, and he kind of ran out of air, too, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> um, but congratulations to Portia um, and, and the team. I mean, it was one of the most viewed uh, episodes of 60 Minutes and uh, won, uh, won the Edward R. Murrow Award, and I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to show my favorite picture of me, uh, of Portia and me. I want to talk a bit about some of the other collaborative work that we're doing in this area right now. Um, some of it is just exploration. Uh, just getting these Cuban scientists in the water, and there's so much to be found. In 99, the last time they were really out there, they found six new species of mollusks alone. So imagine what's just begging to be discovered down there. Of course, the other question is, why is this area so healthy? And is there something here that we can learn that can help us restore our own reefs? The Florida Keys, half the coral reefs have already died off there. It's a terrible situation. And if you remember my slide about what's killing coral reefs, local and global, there's a working theory. If we address the local threats, will that somehow make these coral reefs more resilient to the global threats? So we're convening a group of experts next year to design some science around that very question. Also, our work is moving into the issue of what happens after the embargo. What happens to the environment and these wonderful achievements? You know, um, if the embargo were lifted, you know, posters like this will be on the New York subway, no doubt, during those cold, snowy days. And uh, we worry about tourism in Cuba. Cuba's made some mistakes, like the causeway to Cayo Coco, pictured here, Varadero, resembles Miami and some other areas as well. And the, you know, but at the same time, they have some strong ecotourism programs growing, which could be a good model for the future. But you know, by the 60s, we realized the traditional forms of economics were not adequately capturing the value of the environment. And that's why you know, we're now involved in the largest restoration in human history, the Everglades. Uh, it be a $10 billion restoration effort over, over a number of years. And the question is, can we use environmental economics, which is where you're putting an, an, an economic value on your natural ecosystems, to basically future-proof some of the great things that Cuba has done uh, these, these, uh, these environmental achievements. So we just completed the very first environmental economics workshop in Cuba a few weeks ago um, to look at just that, to look at valuing the ecosystem 
and uh, considering things like tourism and fisheries and other alternative futures that Cuba might have. But when those billion dollar checks start getting waved around in the ministries, we want, we hope that the Cubans have the tools that they need and don't necessarily follow the same path that we've followed. Cuba is a strange country. They believe that climate change is real, that humans are causing it, and they're actually doing something about it. Yeah, I'm, it's a joke, you know. Um, you know, sometimes people forget uh, that Hurricane Sandy uh, hit Cuba well before it hit New Jersey and New York and did devastating damage, especially to Santiago de Cuba. Um, it's a serious situation, and one thing that we're working with Cubans on right now is looking at some uh, renewable energy possibilities. One statistic that really shocked me was that about a half a billion people in the world are dependent on diesel generation in coastal areas. And diesel is the most expensive and the least efficient form of fuel, um, the, or least efficient way to generate electricity, I should say. So we've partnered with a Danish company, um, which of course gets around export issues, um, which have, this Danish companies invented these little buoys that generate electricity using wave energy. And so the idea is to use them in a complementary fashion in some of these remote coastal areas where you would not have to build diesel generators and could plug into the grid to complement other forms of sustainable renewable energy that, that Cuba is already moving ahead with, mostly with Chinese technology. Um, they're also very concerned about food supply, and we heard a bit about organic farming. They formed a new agency f called Basal because of concerns about climate change and its effect on the future food supply. So one of the things that we're looking at are new forms of fish farming, and these are land-based recirculating systems that recirculate about 99% of their water, no chemicals or antibiotics, and basically you get an organic fish at the end. Don't have time to talk about lionfish, but um, Cuba may have, um, because that area is so healthy, a healthy enough predator population. And what we're involved in right now is, is actually trying to train sharks and groupers and other fish to eat lionfish and convince them that they're very tasty. And so far, it's working. But this is where I've gotten sucked back into politics. But this is. This is, um, I think, a good thing. And, and I'm, I'm excited to tell you about it. Um, you know, I, I met with um, Jose Cabanas, the head of mission for the Cuban interest section, early last year. And he said, why can't we have a meeting with Congress to talk about this collaboration and how important it is? And I said, that's a great idea. And of course, easier said than done. But actually, we were successful. If it hadn't been for delays in visas and American Airlines, our Cuban partners would have actually gotten to the hearing in time. But we had a meeting anyway. And we actually had Josefina Vidal um, from MinREx. We had um, really good representation both on the Cuban side. We had the US Department of State. We had um, uh, Leahy's staff and, and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island. Uh, leading this effort, and uh, we had a number of meetings around Washington. Some was covered in the, um, uh, Science Magazine, but basically what came out of that meeting is an agreement by the State Department to lead in an effort to develop a bilateral agreement um, that would facilitate the work that we're already doing, which, as we all know, for all of us doing work in Cuba, is very vulnerable to the way the political winds blow. This would be an agreement that could endure what whoever would come into the White House in 2016, for example. It would address the work we're already doing, but it also would look at three areas where we could do joint government-to-government -government projects together that could really advance marine science and conservation. One would be an international monitoring network to fill in the gaps in our knowledge in Cuban waters and data that would be shared by both countries. Mm -hmm education programs, exchange programs of students to learn about the, uh, these are students that are gonna have to work together in the future to protect these waters. 
and a network of protected areas that both countries would manage and study. And uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, and I'm, I'm, I'm racing, so I know I'm, I'm a little over. Uh, one of our participants, Fabian Pina, was curious why he received a multi-entry visa during his trip, and we learned at one of the meetings that he received an invitation from Secretary of State John Kerry to come back in June to a State Department conference called Our Ocean, which he did, and so did Leonardo DiCaprio, um, and that guy. Um, and so there is Fabian Pina, uh, director of the Cuban Center for Coastal Ecosystem Research in the State Department, Benjamin Franklin Dining Room, which I, in my book, is progress, next to Sheldon Whitehouse and myself. So coincidentally, I ended up in um, Israel shortly after that meeting. And interestingly, <clears throat> the Israelis and the Jordanians in the Red Sea have established what they call an international peace park in the Red Sea to foster joint collaboration and also symbolic to try to improve relations. And when they heard about this effort, they have now invited a delegation of Cubans and Americans to come over and learn from their experiences in the Red Sea and something we hope to do next year and we hope to dive in the Red Sea also. Um, I'm going to close, I'm going to skip a lot of these slides here, um, just by saying, you know, the collaboration is something really significant, and I think there are too few stories about the positive side of what's at stake, what can be gained from collaborating with Cuba, and um, seeing a friendly face on, on our, our our colleagues to, to the south, our friends and colleagues, and images like this. I mean, I think a lot of people that I speak to don't even know there are children and puppies in Cuba, but there are, and they're cute, and they're wonderful and inspirational. So I apologize for going over my time limit, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, David, and we're gonna turn now, we talked earlier today about some of the changes in the Cuban economy, and now Phil uh, Peters, who's one of the preeminent experts and economists looking at Cuba and the U.S. relationship, is going to talk a little bit more about uh, the U.S.-Cuba economic relationship. Okay. Thank you. I wish you had gone longer. I always love your presentations, David. Um, <laughs> how, does the, how does the Danish buoy work? Does it charge a battery or something? Yeah, it just, that lever just generates electricity by moving up and down. So you can plug it in okay. into the grid. Right. We'll talk. All right, we'll talk. Uh. All right, well, now for something completely different. Um, I, I want to take advantage of the microphone to, to touch on a few of the issues that were dealt with earlier in the conference and then get to the, to the economic context in, in Cuba and then, and then through that get to the issue of, of uh, economic engagement between the United States and Cuba. Not to dwell on yesterday's point, but I think it's very important to, to, to hammer home that the, the, the opportunity that we've discussed, that many of us have discussed, that President Obama has, is not a question of, of his authority, it's a question of his will. It's a question of political will. There's no doubt that the law, at the same time that it, that it uh, put into statute all the embargo regulations, it also put into statute his ability to modify them. So he can do a lot. He can't lift the embargo completely, but he can do a great deal, just as he did in his first term, and just as all the presidents since Helms Burton have acted and used that, that regulatory authority, and they've never been questioned and never been challenged legally. Um, President Bush, the 43, uh, think of him what you will, uh, he had a a real policy, a real full policy towards Cuba. Uh, no, I don't think it made any sense. I don't think it had anything to do with, with any aspect of Cuban reality except that it's a one-party communist state. But he had a policy. I mean, he had a vision of what he wanted in Cuba, and he directed his people to go through all of our interactions with Cuba and every aspect of, of, of our government's policy towards Cuba and make those policies change to fit his objectives. 
again, there was a lot of crazy involved, but, but he <laughs> had a full, for, fully formed policy. President Obama's been a little different. He delivered on his campaign promises, and I'll praise him as much as anyone, for virtually ending the restrictions on travel for Cuban Americans and for virtually ending the restrictions on remittances for Cuban Americans and helping a lot of uh, Americans not of Cuban descent to travel more easily to Cuba. Those things have had a, a very positive and very profound impact in Cuba and, and for us as well. But he left the rest of the Bush policy intact. And that's a, at some point, that becomes a conscious decision. It's a, sort of an intentional inaction on his part. And what it's led to has been things such as Alan Gross and Zunzuneo and all the USAID adventures in covert action, which were really programs that were, where the money was in the pipeline and they were carried out in the first part of President Obama's term. It's led to the, to the continued accusation that Cuba is a state sponsor of terrorism, which is uh, quite a statement. I mean, I defy uh, anyone to find an action verb in the State Department's annual uh, uh, accusation that Cuba is a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, and from that directly derives the, the, the financial sanctions against Cuba, which have gotten tougher because as the years have gone by and the United States has become more serious about sanctioning Iran, our, our, our financial sanctions have become tougher, more comprehensive, and more sophisticated. And Cuba is just on the same train. So the, 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 same, uh, the same hardening of financial sanctions that's been applied to actual security threats has, has also applied to Cuba. Uh, and so in sum, President Obama has preserved the intention that's been in US policy since 1961, which is to harm the Cuban economy and to pressure the people that live in it. Now, turning the page, uh, before we get to the issue of, of US, uh, US economic engagement with Cuba uh, and building on the, the panel this morning, I, I think it's important to look at the economic context in Cuba because it's changing a lot. And I think it's a, I think it's a huge story. Uh, and you know, perhaps it's not a huge story as, as much for economic reasons as for the political and sort of sociological ramifications of economic policy. Uh, let me say at the outset, uh, in Miami, a, a lot of people say that I'm an optimist. And in, and in Miami, they, they use that as a pejorative. <laughs> because if you say that, that, the, that in a repressive uh, economic system, they've reduced the repression and they've opened, made some openings, and you say, that's a good thing, well, then they say you're an optimist. I, I have visions of, of like dreams of going to a 12-step program in Miami and saying, hi, my name is Phil and I'm an optimist. <laughs> Please help me. Um, I'm not an optimist. I think you know, the world is in big trouble. But, but the, the, the macroeconomic success of the, of the reform program is not at all clear. It's not, it's not at all clear that they're going to lift GDP the way they think they will. It's not at all clear that they're going to bring in all the foreign capital they think they will. Uh, it's not clear that they're going to pull off a, a successful uh, move to a single currency. Well, there's a lot that, that's up in the air. You know, Maybe like other governments, they'll have to take another crack at the apple. They won't quite achieve what they think they will. But the, but the changes in the, in the, are, are, are still in the Cuban context, they're very clear and they're very big. Uh, just consider that the president of the country and the head of the Communist Party has said that the model is not sustainable and they need to build a prosperous and sustainable socialism. So he's saying it's a, a non-sustainable model. Um, he, president Raul Castro makes jokes now about people, about communists, who use the embargo as an excuse for their economic failures. He demands that, that good communists now respect the growing private sector in Cuba, and he describes it as a legitimate source of employment. I mean, before, it, the government was the source of employment, and the rest was something you sort of held your nose at. That's quite a change. He's reducing the size of the state, the last estimate I saw was about 600,000 workers, and has made it very clear that the state is not capable and is not the best option for carrying out a whole lot of economic uh, production. 
the social contract is changing in Cuba in a very serious way, not just because the government is now allowing private entities to become a source of employment, but because benefits, social benefits that people have been very used to, even though a lot of them are, are not what they used to be, some of them are being reduced and some of them are slated to be eliminated. He's stated very clearly that, that, and the system has stated very clearly, that more foreign capital is essential to their success. Thinking back to Lou Perez's talk yesterday about sovereignty, in the early 60s, Che Guevara said that, that, that when they got rid of all the foreign companies, this was great because they, Cuba achieved economic sovereignty for the first time. Now, not, not everybody would congratulate themselves on that, but, but, <laughs> but that was a big deal. And so now for them to go far beyond what they, what they have had in, since the 90s in terms of foreign investment and to say they need a huge amount compared to before and to, and to hammer time and time again in the, in the Cuban media and in the official discourse that it's not a threat to their sovereignty, that's a big deal. There is also the, the demonstration effect in Cuba of 300,000 new private businesses and changes in agriculture policy and changes in the way farm produce is sold. I mean, again, this is not, these are not things that are going to move the GDP by three points a year, but these happen to be, these two things I mentioned, reversals of very big decisions that Fidel Castro made in 1968 in what they called the Ofensiva Revolucionaria, where they wiped out the, the remaining private businesses. And in 1986, the famous campaña de, de rectificación de errores y tendencias negativas, where they wiped out the ability of a Cuban to grow a tomato in the countryside, carry it to the city, and then sell it on the open market. Another thing that's changing is the, that domestic purchasing power, even though it's still very uneven, is still, it, it's increasing significantly. And so the, the demand in Cuba uh, from domestic purchasing power is increasing. And all of these and, and more things, and by the way, I put a paper there on the table that's, that's two years old, but it is my best effort to try to outline the whole reform process and the thinking behind it. Um, all these changes sort of change for, for many, many Cubans, the, the conversations around the kitchen table, in the sense that there's a lot of new options in play. And a family that was restricted to state employment now, maybe the son or daughter is working in a private business. There's a lot of students that are working even as they go to school. They, they're asking themselves, well, should we sell the house and maybe move somewhere else and keep some of the money as savings? You know, should we travel abroad because they couldn't do that a few years ago? Should we start a business? So these are, these are very profound changes. Again, even though they might not move GDP in the way it, it, that it's, it's envisioned, that, 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 changed the, that reduced the role of the state, not just in the economy, but in direct control of people's lives. And I think over time have a political impact. Uh, and now, James, before you jump on me, finally to answer the question. <laughs> um, right never now, obviously, our economic engagement with Cuba is limited. The biggest, the biggest uh, aspect of it has been the sale of food, which was made possible in, in, in 2000 and began in 2001. It reached food, uh, not just food, but agricultural products, which extends to lumber and even newsprint. Um, it reached levels of like 700 million dollars a year. It's, it's, it's been reduced in, in the last five years or so to about, to about 300 million dollars a year because other countries outcompete us. The United States puts such restrictions and, and onerous terms on the, on the trade that it, it adds to the cost and it, it diminishes the comparative advantage that our exports would naturally have in that market. But still they buy a lot. And so our, our agricultural producers, and especially the big agribusiness, are pretty, are pretty plugged into Cuba and poised to do more. Uh, there is also uh, a, a very minor amount of medical trade, med med medical exports of, 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 uh, of, of medicines and also devices, and, and a great deal of it through donation. Um, there are about a half a million travelers a year. And there's also the Cuban-American remittances and actually investment. Uh, I mean, it's the great irony that, the, that 
the Cuban American community has <coughs> supported the creation of all these laws that restrict our cap capability to, to go to Cuba or to do business with Cuba, but we now have a policy that allows them to travel without restriction and to send remittances without restriction, and these amount to investments. Uh, it used to be that people would mm -hmm. send their aunt money so that she would have you know, $100 a month under the old regulations, so she would have enough to eat during the course of the month. But now people are going and they might be buying the aunt a house, they might be building a little extra room on it so she can rent it out as a, in a bed and breakfast. Uh, the Cuban American economic engagement is, is, is incredible. And it's, it's making a big change on the island and it's also boosting the private sector a great deal. A big question is, is uh, you know, when it comes to corporations is investment. And so there's the question of what, whether Americans would invest, whether, whether there'd be big business investment in, in, in Cuba if our restrictions were to be lifted. I think there would be. I think you've got to start, though, by recognizing that Cuba's competing in a market to attract foreign capital. And Cuba has its own conditions because of their need for sovereignty and self-determination and the socialist system and all that, but they've got their own conditions. And, and their conditions include uh, highly centralized decision-making. They include the fact that you can't buy a piece of land. Now, investors get around that in Mexico, but it's, that's something to deal with. There are uh, the imports, even of uh, materials essential to the running of a, of a joint venture business. Imports are regulated and controlled and, and slow. Uh, Americans are not used to going to a country with, uh, where there's two currencies and where it's going to change. You don't know quite how it's going to work. And, and no one's answered the question of once they have a unified currency, is it going to be a convertible currency or not? I mean, they may, they may solve a lot of problems by unifying the currency, but is it going to be freely convertible or that, is it still going to be uh, a situation where currency is controlled when it comes to, to imports? <clears throat> and of course, uh, uh, international Companies are not used to dealing in countries where when you hire workers, you've got to, uh, you've got to work through a government employment agency to hire, to hire your, your labor. There's no doubt in my mind there would be a wave of exploration on the part of American companies. There might not be a, an overwhelming wave of investment, but you know it, it, it almost doesn't matter because our country is so large, the amount of potential investors is, is so large, and at the margin, the impact of a single investment in Cuba is also so large that if our restrictions were to be lifted, there would be a, a big impact of, even if it's a very narrow segment, that, that decides that, um, that Cuba is worth, worth the risk. Now, what if President Obama were to take some, even some limited actions? Uh, if he opened up travel in a, uh, and made it well, let's say he virtually eliminated the travel restrictions by creating big, broad, general license categories. Uh, there would be a boom in American travel that would outstrip Cuba's hotel capacity right off the bat, as, as Archbishop Wensky pointed out, even though they've quintupled their, their hotel capacity in the last 20 years. Perhaps more importantly, um, it, would, uh, it would allow a, a much larger segment of Americans to travel to Cuba. The, the travel to Cuba now is kind of expensive because of, because of the cost that it takes to operate them. <clears throat> if, the, if the restriction were, were lifted and trips were, were, were more normally organized trips where, where you could just book it online through American Airlines, you didn't have to go through, through a group and all that, it, Americans of more modest means and students would be able to travel much more easily. So the amount of citizen engagement would be much, much larger. Uh, another point, if he were to end financial sanctions against Cuba by removing them from the terrorism list and, and going a little further than that, it would make everything easier in Cuba. It would, it would, it would be an immediate economic stimulus for, for the Cuban economy because it would reduce the, their cost of international credit. It would, take, it, would, it would chop their interest rates by a few points and make them lower and it would re reduce the business risk of operating in Cuba. It would make Cuba immediately a more attractive climate for foreign investment. So that's a case where if, if he were to take that action, foreign companies, uh, at the margin, foreign companies would become much more uh, prone to invest in Cuba. Um, 
When it comes to trade, I mean, it's, it's, there's uh, almost nothing that Cuba doesn't need that we're, we're capable of selling. I, uh, if you look at other sanctions regimes, sanctions that have an actual purpose, like sanctions against Iran to, to uh, hold back their military capability, or the sanctions we had against Libya before, or many other sanctions regimes, regimes that we impose that have a very specific purpose, uh, they all have a, a, a list of exempted items, of exempted uh, items that are completely innocuous, uh, you know, in the case of Iran, for example, that, that have nothing to do with any military capability, much less nuclear capability. Uh, there's no reason why President Obama couldn't do that, couldn't create a list of items that are available for export, but just basically all the innocuous stuff that you buy at Home Depot or you know, or Staples, or Best Buy, or whatever, and, and allow normal household items to be exported to Cuba, and that would be, open up a great market for the United States. Uh, we hear that he's, that, that, that the administration thinks about how to help the private sector in Cuba. That would be a good thing, certainly. Uh, if, if the United, if, if, United States persons, as the lawyers say, were allowed to interact with the private sector in Cuba. They would be able to buy and sell from, from the private entrepreneurs in Cuba, help them with capital, help them with know-how. Uh, they would be able to help these new non-farm cooperatives that are um, clothing manufacturing operations, transportation companies, some construction companies, and, and, other, and, now, and now restaurants that are being converted from state ownership into into the private uh, into a private uh, form the, and they could also help agricultural cooperatives which as we saw this morning the the agricultural production is increasingly in private hands and that would be I mean that'd be kind of a nice thing that instead of instead of American farm interests being interested in merely selling to Cuba we would have a scenario where American agriculture would be able to help Cuba to become more self-sufficient in food and more productive in food production. And that would be, so that would be a good thing and it would also open up the possibility of sales there. In a way, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, this topic reminds me, I had the, the opportunity and uh, the privilege to join the U.S. Chamber of Commerce when, when their delegation went to Cuba and, and the president was asked by a Cuban student what would happen what would the relationship look like, the economic relationship look like between Cuba and the United States if the restrictions were to end? And he started to talk about sectors and he stopped himself and he said, you know something, uh, it doesn't matter. It, what mattered to him, he said, was that Cubans and Americans be able to live in a situation where the barriers aren't there and where young Cubans and young Americans can can develop products together and do research together and develop business ideas together. And then what sector it's going to be in, that's all going to take care of itself. I like this point. I'd like to see us get to a point where, where we think of Cuba as, as we think of any other neighbor. And we want them to be prosperous, and we wish them well. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Phil. And next, turning to health, we'll have Gail Reed. I don't know if you guys have seen her TED Talk, but the last time I looked, it had over 300,000 views, and I encourage you to check it out. Gail, please. Well, and don't expect a TED Talk performance today. Uh, you're going to get all the glitches and everything else that is the real me. Um, health is uh, very much in the news as we're sitting around this table, uh, some of us checking our iPads and phones, and, and we begin to see over and over again Ebola, Ebola, Ebola. Um, it's a perfect storm that is brewing all over the world and is definitely coming home. Um, unfortunately, this uh, virus was discovered as far back as 1976, but it was a virus that at that time only affected a few villages in Africa. Um, and like most of the diseases that are victims of the 1090 gap, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the purview of, of many researchers. Um, we're paying the price today. We're paying the price of uh, broken health systems. We're paying the price of an underfunded WHO. We're paying the price even 
of the fragmented health system we have in our own country. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ebola, Cuba, and the United States as I get into my talk, but I could not start really without uh, talking about this enormous uh, epidemic that threatens really to become the world's biggest health threat since HIV AIDS. Um, I want to thank everybody who's been responsible for uh, making this very unique symposium happen. Um, it's also uh, very special to me because it's my first return to my alma mater in almost 40 years. Uh, I uh, is, am a graduate of the J School. Um, but not long after graduation, I headed to Cuba, um, covered Cuba for many years and for the last 20 uh, in the health sphere mainly, health and medicine, um, primarily uh, through our journal, Medic Review. Um, but the prospect of being back here at the J School uh, also left me sort of with one foot in this panel and one foot in tomorrow's panel on reporting on Cuba um, to think a bit about the stories that I think we've been missing and continue to miss when it comes to U.S.-Cuba relations in health. Um, powerful stories, stories that could reach and shake up ordinary Americans and make us think a bit more uh, about how U.S.-Cuba relations affect our own lives. Um, but first, I need to take a bit of a detour. Um, I need to digress to pay tribute to a very remarkable woman. Uh, when I was here at the J School, I had the privilege of having the best of mentors. Her name was Phyllis Garland. She was the first woman and the first African American to receive tenure at this school. She was uh, exacting, she was funny, she was passionate, and she insisted that all of us, her students, get it and get it right. And I think her wisdom is something that can also inform us as we proceed to rethink this discussion and rethink policy. Because Phil taught us um, to go into a story, sure, with, with a hypothesis, but to leave our baggage behind. To be open to thinking about things that could be surprising, to finding things that are counterintuitive, to reach deeper for the real story, and that all stories are complex. It does no good to dumb anything down. And with the Cuba story, that is certainly very true. And she taught us, once we had the facts, to defend our stories, to stick to them. So her lessons have always served me well, um, starting with my master's thesis, which I dug out the other day. Um, it's called something like this. Rosedale, 1976. That gives you the date. Racism settles on the last frontier, don't we wish? Um, I spent several weeks with a group of Italian Americans in Rosedale who had virtually admitted bombing the home of a neighbor right there in Queens. Um, I wanted to find out why. It was another story from another time. But when it comes to health in Cuba, our baggage, I think Phil would warn us, is almost too heavy to carry. And yet, at the same time, it's filled with myths, many of them that don't have anything to do with Cuba, at least at the outset. The first, of course, is the myth of our own superiority when it comes to medicine and health outcomes. You only have to dig a little bit, however, to find out that our country has appalling gaps in results, gaps that relate to income and race, that relate to place and gender, that we rank last among all of the developed countries when it comes to health care and health outcomes, at least according to studies from the Institutes of Medicine, the National Research Council, and more recently, the Commonwealth Fund. The message is, yes, we have excellent doctors, we have excellent institutions, we have excellent researchers, but all of this alone doesn't add up to good health. 
So then comes the second myth, which is that by outspending the whole world on health, we should be getting the best results. And that's where Cuba begins to creep in. Because by spending 1 20th of what we do on health here in the USA, they're getting very similar results and sometimes better results. So cash-starved Cuba, with its dilapidated hospital, hospitals and poorly paid health workers, and about a third of its doctors abroad is doing a better job. Phil would say that is certainly surprising and very counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. The third myth relates even more directly to Cuba and got hauled out in the debates over the Affordable Care Act. You probably remember it. It was all about the demon of socialized medicine, uh, second only to the death panels um, in, uh, in the debates. Um, the, the logic went like this. Um, in those countries, you're assigned a doctor. You don't get to choose your own doctor. Um, you are forced to go to the physician of someone else's choice. And yet, I was sitting there in Cuba, and sure enough, uh, my son and I had been assigned a, a family doctor and a family nurse in the neighborhood. Um, but I also vividly remember one year that I really didn't like my family doctor very much, and I went in and picked up my clinical history and took advantage of the right I had to take it over to the family doctor in the next neighborhood. Um, and I also remember, unfortunately, taking a headache uh, straight to a tertiary care facility and walking in the door and seeing any doctor I wanted. Um, another whole fabric of myths is we weaved into what you could imagine as a sort of gauze curtain, blurring our visibility with the myth, and this is important, that nothing good can come out of Cuba at all period. Certainly not good medicines, best practices, or medical education that we could learn from, from or use. And thus also woven into that is the myth that the US embargo and all of its corollaries only hurt Cubans. They don't hurt Americans. And finally, that even if some change were in the interests of our own health, there's nothing President Obama can do about it because all of the embargo and its corollaries have been codified into US law by Congress a long time ago. Wrong, wrong, and wrong again. So the challenge is how do we dump all this baggage and get to some stories worth telling that hit home enough for Americans to take notice because, uh, because the fact is that Cuba may actually matter to our own health. I want to preview a few of these stories, ones that offer potential for US-Cuba cooperation in our own public interest, and even in the interest of our national security, and cooperation that does not depend upon Congress, but could happen by executive order alone. Take diabetes. 26 million Americans suffer from diabetes, almost one in 10. Asian Americans, African Americans, Native Americans, poor people in general are the most affected, are at the biggest risk, and also have the most complications. One of the most terrible complications are diabetic foot ulcers. They're responsible for 80 to 100,000 amputations every year in our country. And yet, the Cubans Biotech Center has developed a drug, a medication called Heberpro P. They're, they're not great at branding yet. Um, a medication that's proven safe and effective and has reduced the risk of amputations by as much as 70%. It's been used in thousands of Cuban patients and patients abroad, and after clinical trials has been approved for use and sale in over 20 countries. So you might ask, so why do American patients not have Heberpro P? That is one of the stories we're missing. 
Because of the embargo, special U.S. government licenses from Treasury are uh, required for phase three or any phase clinical trials of a new drug from Cuba in the USA and also for sales of that drug should the clinical trials result in a positive uh, contribution. But the most recent news is that only the part of the license on the trials was approved, not the sales. And if the license on sales is not approved, that means those sales are banned. So then put yourself in the position of either the Cuban company or its French partner. Who would invest in a multi-million dollar phase three clinical trial if later you couldn't sell the drug? What patient would even enroll in such a clinical trial? The second part of that license for sales needs to be fast-tracked, not held hostage. And compassionate care use of this drug needs to be authorized immediately, both things that President Obama himself could do without any other permission. Cancer is the number one cause of death in our own country, as it is in Cuba today. Its victims' quality of life suffering way before death itself. Licensing for Cuban the therapeutic vaccines for various cancers, including head and neck cancer, brain cancer, lung cancer, have fared only slightly better than Heberpro-P, also products of Cuba's burgeoning biotech industry. Cuban researchers need to be allowed to travel to the United States to talk with potential partners and enter into long-term dialogue and why not agreements with the NIH. These are, this is the number one cause of death in both our countries. Then there are Cuban health strategies that we might learn from if we had more opportunities for the kind of travel that Phil talks about and interagency collaboration. Take disaster preparedness, where Cuba does actually a better job of protecting not only people but even property along their stretch of Hurricane Alley. Cuba experienced 10 hurricanes between 2001 and 2007. The death toll, 27. And we all know what happened during Katrina and when Sandy moved up the shores all the way up here to New York. Yet the Cubans really don't have any secrets to success. Most of it's just common sense. They do a better job of public awareness. They do a better job of community participation. They cut the lights. They cut the cooking gas when the winds reach a certain velocity. They save countless lives that way. And they evacuate locally wherever possible. And their early warnings come earlier than ours. The weather stations in Miami and Havana do have regular exchanges. And Cuba allows overflights of US planes into the storm centers. But imagine how much more secure we might be through all of these storms if NOAA and FEMA and local disaster response systems were always at the table with Cuban counterparts. We're always on the other end of the hotline. Climate change is bringing us not only more intense hurricanes, but it's also changing weather patterns that are introducing new diseases into the United States, a few of which the Cubans already have a handle on. Take dengue, carried by the 80s Egypti mosquito, the little guy who has the striped legs, in case you're wondering how to find, how, how to identify one of these mosquitoes. I don't have a slide like, uh, like David did. Probably for the best, yeah. Once uh, this mosquito was only south of the border, but now it is in households in Florida, in Texas, and even in California. Meanwhile, Cuba has the most expertise on dengue of any country in the Americas, 
with the WHO PAHO Collaborating Center at Havana's Institute for Tropical Medicine. They know more about this killer disease than the CDC. They know more than any doctor in the United States. Why do we know this? Well, a number of people in the room have talked about Josefina Vidal, um, the head of the U.S. Department at the Cuban Foreign Ministry. She came up to New York last year for the UN session and uh, she started feeling very ill. She started having pain in her joints. In the English-speaking Caribbean, dengue is known as a breakbone fever. Um, and it, and uh, you get a fever and you feel like your bones are breaking. And she was sent to the hospital and she said, I think I have dengue. And the doctors looked at her and said, and so now what do we do about this? She said, I, I think you should call Dr. Perez at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Havana. And that's exactly what they did. And they were told that the, the course of treatment they were prescribing wasn't the best. They needed to change it completely. Uh, and he recommended an entire new course of treatment. And Josefina was in a few days on her way. But that gives you an idea that we're not prepared for dengue up here. We're not only not prepared for dengue, but the course that Cuba offers every August on dengue for professionals in research and in clinical medicine is almost off limits to US participants. Each single participant has to ask for an individual license to attend that course. Some of them get them, some of them don't. As Phil said, by a stroke of the pen, President Obama could very easily make much of this travel available, possible, and permissible under a general license. There's also another bug that deserves attention among the stories we're missing. It's danger, also a product of climate change. It's a tick. It feeds on cattle and it's moving north over the Mexican border into Texas, Texas, uh, where it's threatening to wipe out entire herds of cattle. Cuba has a recombinant biotech vaccine called GAVAC that cuts the tick's reproduction cycle, not in use in the USA. As journalists, we might ask why not. Cuba's primary care and prevention strategies are also particularly relevant to US medically underserved and disadvantaged communities. We've seen this through the community partnerships for health equity that were set up by Medic a few years ago. We take community leaders, local health departments and healthcare providers to Cuba under special license to share with their colleagues, with patients, with ordinary Cubans to take a look at what Cuba does on the ground. Insights from these trips have already motivated a number of innovative programs, which are now more possible under the Affordable Care Act because it allows more innovation to bubble up from the grassroots. And these are projects that are improving health and health equity in places like Oakland, South Los Angeles, Albuquerque, and the Bronx. But the general travel ban, again, puts a chill on some of these efforts. Instead, and for the sake of better health at home, the president could lift that ban. And not only lift the ban, but also encourage collaboration among local health departments and find the places that we, the points that we have in common between the Cubans and what is the U.S. national prevention strategy now put in place by the Obama administration. And then there is the Latin American Medical School, known as ELAM, graduating 23,000 young physicians from 83 countries since 2005, most coming from the kinds of poor communities that they've pledged to serve when they graduate. This school is the largest medical school in the world, located in Havana. It's trained more doctors for vulnerable communities than any other school in the world. I told only part of that story at TED Med a few weeks ago, mentioning some of the 200 US students 
and graduates that are studying there on scholarship and who are coming back to underserved communities here in the States. The school's emphasis on prevention, community-based training, public health, and patient-centered care are also clues to Cuba's own impressive health outcomes. Once back in the USA, our data is showing that 94% of the alum grads who are in residency programs or have completed them have chosen primary care specialties, the very places where we have the most shortages. They are bilingual, they are debt free, and they are overwhelmingly young people of color. Their education represents a 30 to $40 million Cuban investment in U.S. primary health care. They need to continue to be allowed to study in Cuba, as Colin Powell intended in his original authorization letter. And more broadly, the U.S. should initiate cooperation with ELAM's graduates and with Cuban health professionals serving abroad, especially in Africa. And that brings me to Ebola, the epidemic that may prove to be the biggest challenge to global health, as I said, since HIV AIDS. And it's not only me saying it. It's Tom Frieden, it's the WHO, it's the World Bank, and now President Obama. Ironically, perhaps it presents yet another chance and even a practical political cover for President Obama to offer logistical support to, ne to the nearly 500 Cuban nurses and doctors responding in West Africa to make standard practice of an action taken by a lone U.S. Army helicopter pilot back in 1998 in Honduras a country that was racked by Hurricane Mitch and where the U.S. sent all kinds of military logistic support and the Cubans sent doctors. There were a bunch of Cuban doctors stranded in one place and they had to get to a remote village separated by floodwaters. And the U.S. helicopter landed out of nowhere and said, are you the doctors that have to get to this village? And the Cuban doctors looked at the helicopter pilot and they said, yes, but we're Cuban doctors. And he said, but you're doctors, hop on. Um, we would hope that this would become policy, not just the practice of a single helicopter pilot. And uh, if you've been reading today's stories, we see some encouraging remarks by Secretary of State Kerry, uh, who has actually praised the Cubans for their initiatives. Um, and also we see some Marines who have been making way for the, the Cuban, especially nurses, to uh, set up in Sierra Leone. But this needs to be part of a bigger shift. Switching from that stupid stuff policy that infiltrates HIV AIDS prevention programs in Cuba in the name of regime change to one that saves lives in this global health emergency and helps to prevent Ebola's spread. President Obama has the chance for even further research and development initiatives in cooperation with Cuba to find a vaccine, to find more effective medications than ZMAP. Because like others before and after it, this epidemic, unlike politics, knows no borders. So as I talk about Ebola, Ebola, Ebola it's Ebola in Spanish and Ebola in English. That's why I keep growing up here. Um, I have to go back to Elam, where the list is growing of hundreds of graduates who have written to the WHO to sign up for service in West Africa. They're the heroes of other battles, too, against disease and disaster, beginning with service in Haiti by grads from 27 countries, including the USA. What motivates them? Where do they come from? What's their story? Here to tell you at least one story, his story, is Dr. Joaquin Monante, Latin American medical school graduate, class of 2012. And I have to say hello to Dr. Ida Alston, his wife, who's there with her baby as well, um, who's made it all the way from Brooklyn. Uh, I don't know how you did it so fast, um, where he's now doing his internal medicine residency 
at Woodhull Medical Center, which was just written up in the Times last week. Um, I want to leave you with Joaquin so he can spend, I guess he has about five minutes to tell his own story. And uh, thank you for making it your way up here. I know it's uh, tough to get out of that residency. So, uh, so I guess this is the uh, five minute uh, telling of my story. So uh, my name is Joaquin. Uh, I'm born and raised here in New York, actually born in, in East Harlem, uh, pretty much raised between East Harlem and the Bronx. Uh, went to Fordham Prep in, in the Bronx, went to Cornell for undergrad, graduated in Human Development and Family Studies. Uh, and after graduating from um, undergrad, wanted to begin to do work within my community. I come from two uh, grassroots community activist uh, parents. Um, my father always was an activist around healthcare. Uh, I remember being a kid and him fighting during the Koch administration to keep Metropolitan Hospital open. Uh, for those people who may remember this old history. Um, so this, the issue of health was always very important to me even growing up um, and all through my adolescence and kind of coming out of school. Um, began to do work as a public health organizer here in New York, um, mostly around preventing uh, city cuts to the Health and Hospitals Corporation, making sure that the New York City Department of uh, health, child health clinics stayed open um, and liquid with funding from the Department of Health. Um, really getting involved in seeing every day what was going on on the street level with, with, with our communities when it came to accessing health and maintaining quality health care. So when it came down to say, wait a minute, more than public health, I want to provide direct health care to people, I began to think and look at my options. Uh, and I said, there's no way that I really want, that I want to study medicine within this system. Why? Uh, this is around 2005. World Trade Center had gone down. We were dealing with the issues of the first responders having issues getting quality health care for their respiratory illnesses. We were dealing with soldiers coming from Iraq. I have a military family. I'm the only one who wasn't in the military dealing with issues of PTSD um, and all the barriers that they were getting. And I was saying, there's no way, no way right now I think that this is the place where I, where I feel like I want to learn from. Um, and someone put a pamphlet of the <laughs> Latin American School of Medicine in my hand. And I, had, I was already knowledgeable about Cuba and, and socialized medicine um, and said, you know what? This seems like the kind of place where I can learn, where it really speaks to the type of physician that I want to be going forward. Um, and I had never visited Cuba before. The day I got there was the first day that I have ever been in Cuba. Uh, I wasn't really, you know, I'm, I'm not a communist. This, is, this wasn't a political thing. This was purely dealing with how we should take care of one another. Um, and it, to this day, it's the best decision that I made. Um, we have currently, you know, coming out of Cuba, decided where do you want to practice medicine? Um, I knew I wanted to be in New York, and so when I applied, I applied only to New York hospitals. And when I ranked residency, I ranked New York City public hospitals 1 through 11. Uh, I interviewed at other nonprofit, volunteer, and private hospitals here in New York City. Um, I knew that there wasn't going to be, that, that interestingly enough, I never felt like being a Cuban grad was going to be an obstacle or impede me from becoming a physician. I didn't feel like, I feel like within medicine, um, actually Cuban doctors are pretty well recognized for the high quality of primary care and care that they give. Um, it's, you know, I think it's by... When we practice medicine, most people say, were you a doctor before you got here? And I say, no, I'm a second year medical resident. But it's, it comes all down to the way that you're taught medicine in Cuba. Um, you're taught to be, you're not even taught, it's kind of second nature. You are part of the community. Um, you, more than becoming a doctor for the 
class uh, rewards, the economic rewards. You fulfill this obligation for your, for the, your social responsibility to one another. Um, and I'm very happy to kind of bring that back to medicine here and the medical system here in the US because just like uh, Gail was saying, I don't have any school loans. <laughs> I can do, I have this freedom now because I'm not 200,000 or 250,000 or even $300,000 in debt um, to do what I wanna do and to practice the type of medicine that I want to practice. I don't have to go into allergy or super specialties, which are all needed, not to belittle them. I don't have to become a super specialist to make sure that I reap the financial rewards so I can pay my school loans as quickly as possible and kind of maybe compromise on the values that a lot of doctors wish they could do. They, uh, most, I say, most doctors say, I wish I could take care of folks in the field that I want to take care of them. But, then they say, but I have these huge loans, and I need to take care of it as quickly as possible, so maybe I can't go into primary care because I'm going to make less than somebody who's doing dermatology. I can pay my loans off. I can live well. So Cuba provided this opportunity to myself and to many doctors here in the U.S. And if you look at us, we have doctors who graduated from Harlem Hospital not far from here and who are now attendings there. Um, we have multiple residents at Woodhull. We have... Residents actually throughout the, the at Kings County um, who are now doing uh, specialties, um, we've been very successful uh, in, I think, providing care and, do, and doing it a little differently because when I talk to my, I might be rambling here, when I talk to my colleagues who actually have those loans or who come from, you know, I, I, I'm in a hospital where we're heavy on foreign medical graduates as well as U.S. graduates. You talk to uh, the FMGs, and sometimes the values are different. The values are different. And it's because they, don't, they come from and are educated in systems, and it's not an indictment on it. They come from systems which may not carry the same values of primary care, community involvement, and looking at the, at the person more as, as we say, the biopsychosocial model, taking into account the social determinants of health. Taking into account to what we, you know, we talk about food deserts and people, you know, sometimes when you're, we get caught up in the hardcore science and we lose sight that uh, we're interconnected as a society and we're interconnected as people and communities. And I think that Cuba does a wonderful job in your medical formation of putting the importance on that just as much as they put the importance on the pathology and the physiology. Uh, the pathology of disease and the physiology of our everyday workings as human beings. So I'll leave you there because I think I've talked. That was five minutes of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Marante. Um, I'm looking over to Bruce here because I know we're close out of time. Do you have time for a few more questions? I have time for a few questions. I'm sure people have stuff they want to ask and think about and that would break. Sure. Maybe we'll take a couple at a time if there are. <clears throat> Thank you all for your presentation and um, and all that. I just I just couldn't help myself <laughs> about the and I certainly know about the achievements in uh, Cuban medicine and lobby farm and all that. But um, I, when I, I had a fall in Cuba, I was in a very nice hotel in Miramar and <coughs> slid on some treacherous whatever, and I was taken to a very high end clinic. This is some years back. I mean, it's not immediate, but it's certainly after the special period. And when I got there, there were I was there were three incredible doctors were there, incredible, and uh, talented. And they didn't have anything. They didn't have a band aid. They told me we have nothing. Uh, and this was a high end clinic. On every trip I ever took to Cuba, I brought insulin that I got from my American doctors. And I brought them for two different women, one in Havana, one in Santiago de Cuba, who were fairly well, you know, we used to say the nomenclatura, pretty, you know, they could not get their insulin. 
And the third thing I would say is, and this is a little bit back, during Elian and Gonzalez, one of my sources who was in the family, you know, you know, and I'll just leave it at that, and Juan Miguel, his greatest fear in talking to me was he was scheduled for a, ser a big surgery, and he was so worried that if he was identified by his name, he would lose his slot uh, in being able to have the surgery. And I just mentioned these things as, has this changed? Is there enough insulin for all the diabetics? Are the clinics that even tourists go to, are they now supplied? And my Cuban friends would tell me, when you go to the hospital, you bring your own sheets, you bring your own bandages, you bring your, you bring your own everything, except, as you said, these fabulous doctors. And is, is there remaining fear among ordinary Cubans that they're gonna lose their slot in these surgeries if they say something critical? Uh, that's, that's my question. Sure, and I, we'll take the, a couple and then we can all answer. Does anyone else have a question? didn't have running water at the, the hospital. Um, and, I mean, I, I backed that up as well, though. Excellent doctors, just, just really short on resources. Mm -hmm. and, um, just, just seconding, just, just reinforcing exactly what you said. Yeah. What's going on right now? Like, what are the projects that are happening? Even if you wanna say it off the record, but uh, we wanna know more what's going on. And also, like, um, just to elaborate a little bo uh, more on, on these uh, problems with the health system right now, um, there's a lot of debate on how, like, the exportation of uh, medical services to Venezuela and Africa is impacting the local health uh, system because there's like more than 30,000 uh, 30, doctors abroad. So what's your view on, on, on this impact on the local health services? Let's take that three and then maybe one more round. <laughs> okay, right. let, let me start with the last one. Um, I think when there was, well, since the early 60s, obviously, there have been Cuban doctors abroad. It's been part of policy for forever uh, since the early 60s. Um, but they were usually four to 5,000 uh, doctors abroad until, of course, the big um, collaboration program Barrio Adentro with Venezuela in the early 2000s. Um, in the very beginning, uh, I think it did definitely destabilize primary care in Cuba. Uh, it was uh, an, all, uh, an all of a sudden exodus. Uh, it wasn't a, you know, a, something that happened gradually, it was all of a sudden. And it forced, in fact, uh, them to reconsider and redefine the whole family doctor and nurse program uh, for several years. Uh, until more recently, they've been able then to ramp up through successive graduations of, of new Cuban doctors, um, the um, posting of the family doctors and nurses once again in uh, about, it's about 11,500 uh, family doctor and nurse offices around the country. Um, and they are now fully staffed. The, the family nurse and doctor who once had about 600 patients, now have about 1,500 patients um, under their care, which is actually, in public health terms, better um, because it means they're seeing more of the same diseases and only seeing one patient with something. Uh, they were a bit underutilized, in my view. Um, also, it means that the nurses have more responsibility, which nurses, I think, have always been undervalued in Cuba. Um, that's my own personal opinion. Um, so that's um, on the one hand. On the other hand, they now have a whole new system in place where um, Cuban doctors and nurses are going abroad under different kinds of contracts. Um, it's not now just the small stipend, but they are going under contract where a certain percentage comes back to the health ministry 
to be able to support some of these um, issues that you're talking about, about shortages of materials and all of this kind of thing. And in the health system, the salaries were just raised about two and a half times. Not enough, but, but raised. And, and part of that money is now coming from a health system which over the next five years is expected to sustain itself uh, through the export of medical services and through the export of products. So this is a whole new kind of model. Um, and it will mean that um, doctors and nurses going abroad have more uh, hard currency. It will also mean that there will be more available to the health system. Shortages are real. Uh, hospitals are dilapidated. As you know, Fidel had this great dream of uh, refurbishing, refurbishing 52 hospitals at the same time. Um, there's no way they had the, the construction brigades specialized to do that, um, nor did they have the materials. Um, but it's also a place where the U.S. embargo uh, is, in fact, at fault. Um, I talked to a guy once from Kodak who was down for a health fair, a, a trade fair, and was taking uh, an offer that had been approved by Commerce for this mini-R film for mammography machines. He found that there were so many machines in Cuba that he could have given them a much better price. But he said, you know, if I went down one penny, I'd have to get a whole set of new licenses. It wasn't worth it to me. And he walked out. So um, this issue of bilateral trade, um, the licenses that have to still happen, that have to be given or granted to U.S. companies, but also the question of, of the Cubans being able to sell to the United States to have a better balance of trade and have the cash then to invest in their own system. Um, so, so the shortages are real. Um, I think the medicine shortages are, uh, especially for chronic diseases, are a little better now, uh, but there, there are shortages, absolutely. And yeah, you take your own sheets and bl you know, blankets and a fan, and a fan, definitely and, a fan. And, and, <laughs> and what about, just to keep it on the table, this question about political favoritism and health care, is that fear, I, is it, it? I have not seen that. Joaquin, you can answer that better. I'm not in the hospital every day. You can answer that better than me. Yeah, it, it, I, I never had, I mean, again, I, I was in a hospital in Havana, um, rotated through hospitals in Havana, in uh, adult hospitals, pediatric hospitals, OBGYN, um, and never saw that. If you know a doctor who's in the hospital, maybe you know you could work something out. But in terms of political favoritism, mm -hmm. um, I never had. I, you know, I can honestly say that I never had that. Okay, we'll do uh, one last question, and then everybody needs a break. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I'm, I'm based in Brazil, and it's the latest place where doctors have been exported, but I've covered this issue actually on the island and in Venezuela and in Panama and where all the Cuban doctors have been exported. And, um, and also I have relatives on the island who are doctors. Um, and um, what I have to say is it's, yes, um, it's a lovely picture, and, uh, and I believe in many of the things that you're talking about, but the reality is that um, what many of them have told me, and I've reported on, is that they feel that they, um, in a way, have been held hostage. Um, previously, they, they weren't allowed to travel ever. Um, they were absolutely excluded from um, being able to travel freely and being given visas because they were medical personnel and considered to be vital to the security of the country. And now um, they are exported and they are not allowed to visit their families while they're abroad. Um, their families are not allowed to go and see them in places like Brazil. Uh, they're not allowed to, yes, they get more money, but they don't negotiate their own contracts, which is why when many of them arrived in Brazil, uh, they were greeted with shouts of being called slaves. Um, and, you know, there is a debate about how much freedom these, you know, many of these doctors have. Um, do they do it for the social contract going abroad? Some of them certainly. Others do it because of the financial rewards to support their families back home. So I'd like you to address that conundrum of the idea, which many feel, that the the medical community is being used as a as a tool um, to get oil for the government uh, in Venezuela's case, um, to get um, preferential uh, trade in in the case of Brazil. Thank you. Look, this is this is a complex question. We probably can't go into all the aspects of it now. Um, obviously, there is a social contract when you go into medicine. Um, you know what you're getting into, number one. Um, this is not 
you know, this is not, you don't go into medicine blind in Cuba. Uh, you don't decide to become a doctor uh, blind. You know what you're getting into. You know that you can be sent abroad if you volunteer, which it is voluntary. And I don't think anybody's questioning that. Um, and I think that they're, they're facing a really practical issue here, which is how the hell are you going to support this health system? Um, and I think that what happens is, uh, for many, many years, the doctors that I saw abroad were going abroad, and they were receiving a stipend of $150, $200, $300 a month. Um, many, many thousands of them did that. Um, partly because they wanted to serve, partly because they wanted to go abroad, partly because they wanted to challenge their skills, and partly because they wanted to send what little money they earned home. Um, now you have a whole different situation in which um, they can earn more money by going abroad. Um, they can travel um, after, the, after the new immig immigration uh, rules came out. Um, and the other time it was for a five-year period, um, which I could understand. The problem was that they elongated the period um, too much. Um, but I think that the, the issue is really a practical one. Again, I don't, I don't think anybody's being held hostage. I think people go in with their eyes open to, to medicine in, in Cuba. They know exactly uh, what the rules of the game are. Um, and actually, the rules have gotten better um, for, for almost all of the physicians. And this health system, uh, you, you have in, a, in the Constitution, which many of the Latin American countries have, by the way, that says, we provide, as a government, health care for all of our citizens. Whether or not governments really live up to that or not, that's the question in Latin America, as you know. Um, but in the case of Cuba, folks have gotten pretty used to being able to go to the doctor and, uh, and not get a bill later. They've gotten pretty used to having a doctor and nurse around the corner or a hospital down the block, however dilapidated, however, uh, however many shortages you might have. And so taking that away is a bigger political price, really, than trying to make this, this health system sustainable. A okay. uh, quick comment from Joaquin, and then we'll just wrap it. To, just to follow up with that, I think it's also um, my professor, my mentor, <coughs> somehow I even think sometimes I call him father. Um, who's in Cuba and is a professor there, uh, you ask him and he'll never leave. You know, this is because this, the social obligation is something that makes up who he is. And he went into it with his eyes open. I think the other part is what is the beauty of the Latin American School of Medicine is uh, my roommate in second year, who's Brazilian in Ubatuba, is now providing care in a place where there were no doctors before. And it was actually the Brazilian government that made it very difficult for him to get started doing his work. So uh, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, he'll eat forever. And I think that's what the beauty of the Latin American School of Medicine is when they begin to form doctors, not just in the US, but in Brazil and Venezuela, in Uruguay, Paraguay, Colombia, Bolivia. You go down every single country, go down from Mexico all the way down, and you're going to find physicians trained in Cuba with the obligation of of, of providing care in those underserved communities that physicians trained there weren't really able to get to. Okay, thank you, powerhouse panel, uh, who ended the day really on a bank.